Welcome back for our second lecture. Uh, just before um, we went for our break or in the first lecture, we were continuing our study of chapter four, the nature of a God-given vision. Uh, we were looking at the 11 uh, insights concerning God-given vision, and we um, looked at nine of them. We still have two more to go through. Uh, so we'll look at the 10th and the 11th one. Uh, the 10th uh, uh, insight concerning a God-given vision is that, you know, other people will find and fulfill their life's calling by participating in a God-given uh, vision. So many people will find and fulfill their life's calling even as they step into and become part of the God-given vision or the vision that God has given us even as they step into the vision or the mission that God has given us or even as we step into other uh, people's God-given vision and mission, you know, um, we can find and fulfill, uh, you know, uh, the calling that God has uh, for us or they can, you know, we can find uh, of our uh, calling, we can also fulfill our calling, or if people come and step into our vision and mission, they can also find and fulfill their own life's uh, calling. So in our sharing of our vision, uh, our agenda is not to use other people for our own interests, even as you know, God brings in people uh, to co-work and co-labor with us in fulfilling his plan, his vision and his mission for our lives. You know, even as we share our vision with them, our agenda is not to use other people for our own interests. Uh, that is completely wrong. But, you know, um, and having other people step into the vision God has placed into our hearts, you know, we should have also their best interest in our mind. You know, we need to see what God has placed in their lives, you know, uh, what the God has called them to do, uh, you know, uh, even as they co-labor uh, in our vision and in our uh, mission. So we just encourage them, we strengthen them, we build them up, and we just uh, support them, okay? Uh, the eleventh one is uh, uh, dreams and visions are given to the body of Christ and our intellect. Okay, now since we are part of the body of Christ, you know uh, each one of us uh, have uh, you know different visions, missions, calling, purpose that God has given us, but. Even though it is uh, different from another person in the body of Christ, yet we are all as a as a body uh, as one as body of Christ. We are one. We are interdependent, and we are closely interlinked uh, with each um, other. And we need to know that you know um, we cannot fulfill our calling outside of the body. We are called to fulfill our calling within the context of the body of Christ because we're all to, uh, called together to the same hope and we are part of one body, one spirit, just like it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. There is one body, one spirit, just as we are called in one hope of our uh, calling. And verse uh, 16 of chapter 4 says, you know, uh, we are one body, we are joined and knitted together, you know, and everyone uh, works effectively, uh, you know, uh, to cause the body to uh, grow and for the edification of the body. And hence, we need to share and work effectively together uh, for the growth and for the edifying of the body of uh, Christ. Okay. Uh, so each one of us, you know, um, uh, supplies or contributes or supports others so that we all together can build the body. And even as we step into other people's dream and fulfill their vision, you know, we would in fact or in effect carry it out uh, and fulfill God's vision for our own lives, uh, you know, one fine day. Okay. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, just to end this lesson, you know, we need to ask God to give us a big heart, not just a big vision. Like I said, you know, God's vision for our lives is is big, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, even as God has given us a big vision, you know, 
we should also have a big heart. Some of us, God has given us a big vision, but we have a small heart, which means there is room only for ourselves. It's all about I, me, myself. You know, there's no room for anyone else, but a big, a big vision requires a big heart. And we must have a heart that is big enough, you know, to provide room for everyone. God has intended to be part of this vision uh, or, uh, you know, the mission that he has for us, everyone that he sends to fulfill our God-given vision and um, mission, okay? And um, a big heart is a heart that is, uh, you know, free from insecurity, jealousy, competition, and... Um, self-centeredness okay a big heart is a heart that does not feel insecure when others come in and help us it's not jealous when you know other people in our uh, who are there to fulfill our vision and mission if they seem to be uh, you know uh, talented skill more highly talented skill than we are so there is no jealousy that is there uh, we don't compete with them and there is no um, self-centeredness and also a big heart is a heart that recognizes and celebrates God's work uh, uh, in, in, uh, in other people's life what he is doing and is a heart that encourages and empowers other people to do what God has called them to do not just to stay with us lifelong because they're superly skilled talented we would like to hold them back keep them with us you know uh, not let them go and if they want to go you know and do what God is calling them you know, we get upset and angry and disappointed and make life for, uh, difficult for them and that is not what we need to do we need to release them uh, and set them you know let them go with blessing them giving them whatever is needed supporting them so that they can go and fulfill their vision and calling uh, in your life and it's also maybe you know they're there in just for a season that God has called them and now he's enabling them or help, uh, getting them uh, to reach their Kairos moment where he wants them to launch out and fulfill their vision and mission that he has for their lives. Okay, so that is chapter four, the nature of uh, God-given um, vision. Uh, we'll move on to chapter uh, five. Chapter five is a kingdom builders uh, lifestyle. Okay. Okay. Um, Often in kingdom building, we get so preoccupied with the work that, you know, that we are supposed to do that we forget that God is more interested in us as people than in the work that, you know, uh, is done through um, us. Okay. So uh, uh, this chapter, we are going to be looking at key highlights of, you know, who we are and the life we need to live as kingdom builders and even as we uh, look at uh, these key elements on who we are and the life we need to live as kingdom builders we will address uh, this in three main areas godly character uh, spiritual maturity and uh, stewardship okay godly character uh, spiritual maturity and uh, stewardship now what is godly character um, and uh, you know uh, why is godly character important uh, or godly, uh, you know, and what is godly character? Okay, so what is character? Uh, character is, uh, you know, our temperament, our personality, uh, you know, basically who I am as a person. It's my nature, who I am as a person. And uh, our character is who we really are as a person. Uh, it's not what I assume to be before others. It's not what others assume uh, me to be. But, you know, it is who I am really as a person. And my character is revealed through my conduct, okay? Uh, and my actions, reactions in unexpected uh, circumstances, in difficult situations and circumstances reveal my character. And the secret choices that I make also reveal my character. My attitudes, words, decisions also reveal my character. Okay. And it's my value system that influences the choices that I uh, make. Okay. Now, one of the greatest examples of a godly character in the Bible is Joseph. You know, he faithfully served. Uh, 
for about 11 years uh, in Potiphar's house. And we know that Potiphar entrusted his entire household into Joseph's hand. But, you know, uh, it also was a very difficult time in Joseph's life. And we read about this in Genesis chapter 39, verses 1 to uh, 12. We see that, uh, you know, Potiphar's wife had an eye on Joseph and she would all often, you know, uh, pull him towards her to lie with her. And, you know, um, uh, uh, Joseph would refuse to do that because uh, he would tell her that, you know, uh, there is no one greater in this house than he is, uh, you know, and his master has not kept back anything from him, excepting his wife, because he, she is his wife, then, you know, how can he do such great wickedness against his master? And also, how can he sin against uh, God? And so we see that even as Joseph spoke to her day by day, she did not heed, you know. Uh, so one day when no one was, none of the men were inside the house, you know, uh, she caught him by the garment, garment saying, you know, lie with me. This is, uh, we read this in uh, Genesis chapter 39, verse 12. And what does uh, Joseph do? He, you know, just runs away. He just flees. He runs outside, leaving the garment in her hand. So we see that, you know, um, uh, uh, over and over, you know, uh, Joseph was saying no to uh, uh, Potiphar's uh, wife, even as she made those advances. But, you know, we need to, uh, 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 if you look at this passage, we learn that the power to say no comes from a strong uh, character, right? Because... Um, Verse 8 in the same chapter of Genesis chapter 39, you know, um, uh, it says that, you know, Joseph, but he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house and he has committed all that he has to my uh, hands. So, you know, uh, that comes from a strong uh, character. Also, something that we can learn from this is that our conscience will keep us always accountable to God, even when nobody is uh, watching. So verse 9, uh, we read that, you know, Joseph says, you know, that, um, uh, you know, there is no one greater in this house than I am. And, you know, um, uh, Potiphar has given me in charge of everything excepting you because you are his wife. And how can I do this great wickedness against him and against uh, God? And also we see that the ability to say no when temptation persists is possible only when we have a strong uh, character, right? We read this in verse 10. She says, you know, uh, 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 she spoke to Joseph, uh, as it says that, you know, so it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. And also something that we can learn from this uh, life of Joseph is that a strong character cannot be weakened and will not give in to continual uh, temptation. Verse 10, we see that, you know, even as she spoke to Joseph day by day, he did not heed to her and, you know, did not uh, be with her or even lie with her. Okay, so we see that Joseph is a very uh, a good example, one of the greatest examples of a godly character uh, in the uh, Bible. Now, how is character developed? Okay, uh, what influences or shapes uh, the development of an individual's character? Uh, we look at the, another example of Daniel in the Bible, a man with a strong moral uh, character. And we will just examine Daniel's life uh, to see how godly character is uh, developed or how God developed character in him and how we can develop godly character in our uh, lives. Okay. Now, Daniel was born in Jerusalem, but when King Nebuchadnezzar uh, invaded uh, uh, Jerusalem, he took all of them, all of the uh, uh, Israelites as captives uh, to, uh, uh, to Babylon. And, you know, uh, uh, Daniel and his friends were chosen, uh, you know, to live in the palace so that they can be trained to be uh, future officers or work in uh, uh, King uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, 
palace. Okay, but we see that you know uh, they were offered food from the king's table. Uh, they were offered food and wine from the king's table. But we see that you know Daniel and his friends uh, refused to eat that food. Um, they told the um, person who was serving the food, you know, just to give them. Uh, uh, vegetables and water for 10 days and if they look weak and compared to the other boys then they will agree to uh, eat the food that was served from the king's uh, table uh, but we see that you know when at the end of the 10 days they were looking more healthier stronger uh, than the other boys and so the uh, officer you know he decided that he he will allow them to eat uh, um, you know boiled vegetables and drink water for the rest of the three years that they were being trained in the uh, palace okay or um, uh, or in king nebuchadnezzar's uh, uh, you know um, uh, uh, palace yes so um, we see that you know daniel would have been very very young uh, you know maybe somewhere between 16 and 17 years so daniel's character you know was developed from a very young age he stood by his convictions you know uh, it says in daniel chapter 1 verse 8 that daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine which he uh, drank so we see that god honored uh, the stand that Daniel and his friends took okay so it's never too early to start working and uh, you know developing a godly character another thing that we can learn uh, about uh, you know the godly character in Daniel and how God developed character in him is that you know a man's companion influences his uh, character right so uh, Daniel was friends with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They also refused to eat the food from the king's table. And we see that, you know, uh, when they were made officers in King Nebuchadnezzar's uh, palace, um, uh, you know, we see, um, or in his, in his office, you know, um, we see that uh, when King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, you know, um, and uh, since no one was able to interpret the dream, uh, the king said that he's going to kill all the officers in his um, uh, palace. And, you know, when Daniel hears of this, he asks time from King Nebuchadnezzar, and then he goes to his house and, um, and he makes the decision known to his friends and they pray about it and how, you know, um, uh, uh, God reveals not only the dream but also the interpretation of the uh, dream okay so uh, it's to develop a godly character it's important that you know uh, uh, our companions uh, are also godly because a man's companions influences his character okay Third thing that we can learn is strong character or moral character is built over time through discipline and uh, practice, okay? Uh, we read in uh, Daniel chapter 6, you know, when Daniel knew that, uh, uh, you know, the king had signed this decree uh, that no one is going to, no one is supposed to worship or pray to any other uh, god, uh, uh, but we see that, you know, we read uh, in Daniel chapter 6 verse 10 that Daniel went home and he went to his upper room and he opened the windows uh, in his upper room that was facing towards Jerusalem. He bent down on his knees um, uh, three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Okay, so, you know, it was something that he was practicing and doing since his early days. And it was something that he did not give up, even in the face of difficulty and a challenge and the threat to his very life. So strong moral character is not something that is built in a moment, in a day, you know, but it's built over time and it's built through discipline and practice. So we see that even as it was his custom, his discipline, his practice is, you know, go to his upper room, open a door towards a window towards Jerusalem and, you know, fall on his knees and pray to God three times. He just did that, even though uh, the king had said that no one is supposed to pray uh, to any other God. The other thing that we can um, learn is... Um, the fourth thing is that strong moral character is strengthened through adversity, okay? 
uh, we read in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, it says, you know, we glory in tribulations, you know, uh, or we rejoice in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. So even when you go through difficulties and even when we go through difficulties, uh, tribulations or hardships, you know, we need to take glory in that because we know it's going to, you know, the end result is going to help us to be to persevere more and that perseverance is going to shape and build our character and you know it's finally going to give us hope you know that God is going to come through in our um, lives. Now why is character important? Um, godly character is um, a prerequisite for kingdom uh, ministry. Uh, now, when the Apostle Paul wrote to uh, Titus and Timothy on appointing spiritual leaders in the churches at Ephesus and at Crete, where he had left Titus uh, at Crete and left Timothy at Ephesus, you know, he writes down the list of qualifications, uh, which is important or the important character uh, uh, that is important to choose or to look at when he is appointing uh, spiritual leaders. And um, it's, it's surprising because, you know, when you look at First Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 15, and, you know, Titus 1, 5 to 9, it's there in your publication, page number 85. It's surprising because in that list, which he's writing of qualifications, you know, he's talking not about more about spiritual gifting anointing well spiritual gifting and anointing is important but you know um, uh, you know uh, uh, what is the use if you know our character and lifestyle is not god honoring and godly there's no point in having those spiritual gifting and um, anointing and so if you look at first timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 15 and Titus 1, 5 to 9 is surprising because he writes that, you know, if you choose a leader, a bishop, you know, he must be somebody who's blameless, husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his house well, you know, um, Oh, who's not puffed up with pride, you know, who has a good testimony with those who are on the outside. And a uh, deacon must be reverent, not double tongue, not given to wine, not greedy for money. Uh, you know, the pure conscience, uh, blameless, uh, you know, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things, and reverent. So if you look at this list, it's, you know, talking about a person's character and lifestyle more than, you know, the kind of gifting or the anointing or, you know, how well they preach or how they're good at administration. Nothing of that is mentioned, but, you know, uh, it's talking more about the importance of character and uh, a lifestyle. And so also when he writes to Titus, who is in Crete in Titus chapter one, verse five to nine, uh, most of the things that I said is also mentioned there, uh, you know, um, uh, and we see that, you know, uh, godly character is the foundation for ministry. Godly character is a foundation for all kingdom building uh, work. And the true strength of our ministry is not in our character, but uh, sorry, it's not in our anointing, but our character. I'll repeat that again. The true strength of our ministry is not in our anointing, but in our character. Okay. Uh, just to uh, reiterate that, we look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 17. Okay, uh, Jesus says, Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Okay, so what does it mean here in this context? Now, the um, anointing is the wine. And our character is the wine skin. Now, if the wine skin is, you know, is old wine skin, it's weak. Then, if the you know new wine is poured and it expands, you know, the wine skin will burst, and you know the the it'll ruin the wine skin and also the wine. In the same way, you know, um, uh, if you know our character 
ca character the wine skin is our ca is the character you know if our character is uh, you know is is not good then you know the anointing that god pours into our lives will be uh, wasted you know uh, uh, there is a saying i think you've heard this saying before you know your gift cannot take you where your character cannot keep you you can have the you can be very highly skilled talented knowledgeable you know um uh uh, uh superly intelligent also you can uh, you know um uh, uh, do things with the great excellence but you know uh, if you don't have the right character you know your gift cannot take you where your character cannot keep you there is no point in that gifting there is no point in that anointing Okay. so we need the strength of character to help us um, uh, you know sustain the heights that the spirit is uh, taking us into or where god is leading us to okay um, now your moral character is your true strength okay um, the man, a person's real character is his moral character it's uh, your inner strength your moral character actually determines your ability to withstand temptations accuse uh, accusations you know seductions uh, you know uh, the lies of the enemy uh, pressures that you face and even uh, persecutions uh, your character will shape the most important message you will ever preach okay look at what paul says in first thessalonians chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 he says in verse 5 you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake so he's you know he's just his life is so open like an open book they were able to read it and he says you know what kind of men we were among you and in uh, the same uh, uh, epistle first thessalonians in chapter 2 you know verse 3 he says you know um, our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness nor was it in uh, deceit that means he says you know our life is not a life of uncleanliness or living wrong lifestyles or a deceitful life but our exhortation our teaching you know came from lives that are honorable and well pleasing before uh, god okay um, and he says in verse 4 the same chapter you know uh, even as we speak we speak not pleasing men uh, but we you know uh, we speak as ones pleasing god because god is the one who tests our heart okay and verse 6 he says not not do we seek glory from um, men and look at what he says in verse 7 he says we were gentle among you okay and verse 8 he says you know we imparted to you not only the gospel of god but also our very own life so he says here we're not only teaching you about the gospel but we are people who are living the same gospel uh, you know um, uh, practicing that own gospel and our very lives is you know a gospel that we are living that we are pre that people can see and know uh, about uh, jesus christ and uh, in verse 10 he says you are witnesses and god also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you among you who believe so you know he's saying all of these things and he's you know so confident that the way he's lived his life that you know lived it in uh, utter obedience in uh, uh, you know utter holiness uh, righteousness uh, so that no one can even blame them for anything that they um, would have done or said or acted that is not you know honoring in god's sight so our lives peak you know and i think the greatest message paul would have uh, preached is about is the way that he has lived his life and the greatest message we will ever preach is the life that we uh, live now people can forget our sermons or people can forget what we teach or preach but they will remember the life that we uh, live okay now character also uh, determines your uh, durability um so you know um, fame can come in a moment you know uh, but true greatness comes with longevity uh, said by dr edwin lewis cole okay so um, 
you know, uh, how long we do well in life, uh, how long we can be successful, uh, make an impression, make an impact, uh, do things, uh, you know, depends on our character, okay? Spiritual maturity is as important as spiritual uh, gifting, okay? So what we just looked at is um, uh, character, godly character, and uh, we said that, you know, um, three things that we would be looking, three main areas uh, or key elements of who we are and the life we need to live as kingdom builders. The three areas that we are addressing is godly character, spiritual maturity, and uh, stewardship. Okay. So we looked at godly character. Now we look at um, spiritual maturity. Now, spiritual maturity is as important as a spiritual uh, gifting. So what is a spiritual maturity? Uh, what does it mean to be spiritually mature? And how do we assess if we are truly maturing uh, spiritually? Okay. Now, there are three Greek words that are often used in the New Testament in the context of spiritual maturity. And these uh, three Greek words, when translated in the New Testament is translated as uh, complete in English. But if we study or examine these uh, Greek words, it just provides, uh, you know, a whole lot of uh, a wealth of uh, information and revelation and uh, truth. So uh, in the English, it's just limited to one word complete, but in the Greek, it provides, you know, just additional insights. Uh, so in the Greek, uh, spiritual maturity can either mean in different places, it can be a teleos or pilerio or katharitz. Okay, so three Greek words, teleos, pilerio, and katharids. Uh, now, what is the meaning of teleos? Teleos is, uh, again, if in English it's complete, but, you know, of full age, mature, you know, a perfect man or a perfect woman. It literally means, you know, a full age or grow up to be an uh, adult. So it's often used in the context of maturity, uh, you know, when a person is a full age or perfect or complete man or a woman, it basically refers to growth in both the mental and moral character. Mental and moral character, you know, we are adults, you're mature and, you know, you're able to handle uh, uh, things well as a mature grown-up person. Now, the word Greek word pilero means to fill up or to be full of. Okay, uh, and in the English it's again translated complete, but in the Greek it means to fill up and to be full of. Uh, and uh, the third Greek word it's uh, katharitz, okay, uh, which means uh, to be thoroughly equipped, okay, uh, thorough equipping or to be thoroughly equipped. Now, uh, this, we look at seven characteristics of spiritual maturity. And even as we look at the seven characteristics of spiritual maturity, we will just look at these three Greek words in the New Testament and identify seven characteristics of spiritual maturity um, as, uh, you know, uh, related with these three Greek words in the New Testament. The first one is, uh, you know, first characteristic of spiritual maturity uh, is spiritual maturity is growing in Christ likeness. Okay. And we connect this with the Greek words that we, uh, three Greek words that we looked at. So in Matthew 5, verse 48, uh, you know, Jesus says, therefore you shall be perfect. Perfect here is the word teleos. Um, teleos means, you know, um, mature, uh, you know, coming to full uh, age, mature, uh, perfect, a complete man or a woman. He says, therefore, you shall be perfect, teleos, just as your father in heaven is perfect. So Jesus is challenging here people to be full grown, mature people, uh, you know, of full of age, uh, full age, like adults, you know, um, uh, uh, to be mature, uh, uh, like adults, knowing what to do, what steps to take, how to behave. And he says, you know, that is how God is. God is not childish uh, and he wants us to be like him. Okay. Ephesians 4.13 says, till we all come 
to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. Perfect here is teleos, perfect man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So being a spiritually mature person or a perfect person means we come to a place where we are in full stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay, so spiritual maturity is basically growing in Christ likeness. And it's, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 14, verse 15 says that in all things we have to, you know, grow into Christ likeness. We are called to grow in all things uh, into Christ likeness. So, which means all areas of our life, uh, you know, uh, 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 should be aligned to who. God is or how Christ is and Christ must be made manifest in every area of our um, lives okay now we need to understand that this is what God is working uh, to accomplish in us even as we you know go on in life and even as God wants to do this in our lives we need to keep this as a focus uh, and you know we need to submit and surrender and allow him uh, so to the extent that we allow him to the extent he sank the Holy Spirit sanctifies us and makes us like um, Christ another uh, verse we uh, we look at is Colossians chapter 1 verses 28 and 29 he says him we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect teleos in Christ Jesus. He says, to this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So this is, or this should be the goal of Christian ministry, uh, you know, that we present each person full of age, full age, sorry, full age, mature adults in Christ. That means people who are, um, you know, mature in their walk, in their understanding of the nature of God's will, of what God requires them, uh, how they need to live and how they need to go about doing things in life. The second thing is spiritual maturity is being perfect and complete in all the will of God. Okay, uh, so Colossians chapter 4, verse 12 says, uh, you know, talks about Epaphras. Uh, you know, uh, Paul is writing to the church at Colossae, and then he, is, uh, he says that Epaphras, who's with him, greets uh, the believers at Colossae. And he says that, you know, Epaphras has been praying for the believers at Colossae. And what is his prayer? He, sa he says that they may stand perfect, perfect teleos, you know, full. Uh, age mature adults and complete pilerio okay uh, in all the will of uh, god so what is pilerio that means to fill up or to be full of okay so to fill up or to be uh, full of so uh, Epaphras prayer is that you know believers stand perfect that means they be full age mature and they are full of you know uh, 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 they are full of in all the will of God. That means in every area, you know, uh, what this verse is teaching us is that in every area, we are to be fully aligned uh, to the will of God, you know. Yes, we need to be fully grown, fully developed, um, without nothing lacking, uh, not falling short of anything in the will of God for our uh, lives. And even as we, uh, you know, surrender and bring all of the areas of our lives in uh, subjection, in submission, in obedience, in alignment to the will of God, you know, we will in all things grow to be uh, like Christ. And, uh, you know, uh, we would also, you know, grow to be spiritually mature and full of uh, full age. The third thing is spiritual maturity is being thoroughly equipped for every good work now growth in spiritual maturity is you know uh, thoroughly equips us for every good work and it's a progressive thing something that you know progressively happens in our life but even as we grow in spiritual maturity it equips us for every good work so let's look at a verse in second corinthians chapter 13 verses 9 and 11 um 
Paul is uh, praying uh, that, you know, that the believers at Corinth would be made complete. That means uh, katharizo, okay? And uh, the Greek word katharizo means to be thoroughly equipped. So he's praying for the church, uh, for the believers at Corinth. He's saying that my prayer is that you may be made complete, okay? Complete means what? That, you know, um, uh, they will be thoroughly equipped in every good work. And then in verse 11, he says, finally, brethren, farewell, become complete. That means, you know, be thoroughly equipped in every good work. And he says, be of comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Okay. So from these verses, uh, we learn that, you know, we must pray for ourselves and also pray for believers that, you know, we will become thoroughly or fully equipped uh, to do every good work that God has called us to do. And also we can pray for believers that they will become fully equipped or thoroughly equipped to do everything that God has called them to uh, do. Okay. Uh, so even as God, you know, takes the initiative of, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting us to be spiritually mature and working in us, you know, it also there is a responsibility in us, you know, uh, we need to, uh, uh, you know, be willing, submissive, submissive, yielded, and do what it takes to equip ourselves, you know, towards uh, growing spiritually um, mature, okay? Uh, we we'll look at another verse in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. It says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete. That may, means make you fully equipped or thoroughly equipped in every good work to do his will. So the word complete there is Greek word is katharizo, which means fully equipped, thoroughly equipped to do every good work, to do his will, working in you what is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So here again, we see the prayer uh, is for God to work in the believer's life, bringing about full equipping to carry out every good work according to his will. Okay. Uh, now, we cannot receive this equipping to work out every good work apart from God working in us and bringing about what is well-pleasing in his sight. So this equipping happens as God works in us, enabling us to do what is well-pleasing in his sight. But for God to work, God cannot just work in isolation. He co-partners with us, co-labors with us. So we need to be willing, we need to yield, submit, and allow him to do so. Okay. Look at what uh, Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Okay. So the Lord Jesus desires that all of us, his disciples, be like him. And for us to be like our teacher, we need to go through this process uh, or to thorough training and uh, equipping. And Ephesians chapter 4, where uh, verse 11 and 12, it talks about the you know, fivefold ministry offices. Uh, we know in verse 12, it says for the equipping, okay, katharizo uh, uh, is the word there, uh, you know, of the saints for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. So one of the fivefold uh, uh uh, sorry, one of the functions of the fivefold ministry is the thorough equipping of the saints, you know, for uh, uh, doing the work of the ministry in the body of Christ. The fourth one is that spiritual maturity is having the ability to receive solid meat. Okay, Hebrews chapter 5. Uh, you know, the writer of Hebrews says in verse 14, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that means teleos you know, full age, mature adults, that is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and uh, evil, okay? And Hebrews chapter 6 verse uh, 1 says, uh, you know, 
uh, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. That means teleos, being full of full age, you know, mature adults. And First Corinthians chapter two, verse six and seven says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Mature means full of age, uh, you know, adults, grown up, you know, um, and uh, you know, he says that. Uh, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the ruler of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in mystery and the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. So what do these uh, verses uh, mean? It says those who are mature, those who are of full age, you know, can receive a solid food. That means they can receive the revelation of God. Uh, and uh, these people are people who have gone past the basic elementary principles, you know, uh, 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 you know, and they're pressing forward towards spiritual maturity, uh, spiritual growth, coming, becoming of full age. And these are people who will be able to receive the understanding of the revelations and the mysteries uh, of, the, of the kingdom of God. And these are the people who will receive wisdom. So if you want to receive wisdom, if you want to receive uh, revelations, understanding the profound truths in the word of God, or we need to, we want to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of God, then we must be people who are, you know, uh, spiritually mature, growing spiritually uh, mature. Okay. The fifth thing is that the spiritual maturity is having our senses trained to discern both good and evil. So Hebrews chapter 14 5 verse 14 says, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is those who by reason of use have the senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So spiritually mature person is somebody, you know, have the senses trained, uh, you know, that means, um, you know, uh, they at any given point of time, uh, they know what is good and bad, what is evil, what is uh, 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 holy, what is right, what is good. And, you know, their soul, their mind, will and emotions have, uh, uh, you know, are just being fed uh, by the word of God. And because the word of God is uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, part of their mind, soul, and emotions, uh, you know, that, uh, and the truth of God is so imparted into their minds, will, and emotions that it's constantly working in them. Uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, they come to a place where they're trained to know what is right and wrong, what is good and uh, evil, okay? So, uh, for example, you know, uh, Joseph and Daniel, you know, they had their senses trained from a very young age to, and that's why when they were, you know, uh, uh, they were encountered, they encountered uh, situations and circumstances and temptations. They held on uh, to what was uh, God honoring, what God wanted them to do, what was written in the word. Why? Because their senses were uh, trained. Their mind, will, and emotions were uh, had been tempered by the truth, were tempered by the word of God, and hence they were already trained and they know what they knew what to do in what situation, uh, and they uh, did what was right. Uh, the sixth one, spiritual maturity is putting away childish uh, behavior, okay? Um, so First Corinthians, you know, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. He says, you know, um, uh, brethren could not, uh, uh, you know, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal as to babes in Christ. So he's telling the church at Corinth, even though they were flowing mightily in the gifts of the Spirit, there was, he was saying, hey, you're not spiritually minded, you're not spiritual people, you're still carnal, you're still babes in uh, Christ, you know. Um, and uh, he says, because you're carnal, you know, there is envy, strife, divisions among you. Uh, and are you not carnal and behaving like mere men in verse 3? And, you know, um, and because you're carnally minded, one of you says, I'm, of, I'm following Paul. Other says, I'm following Apollos. And he says, aren't you carnal? Okay. Um, so, you know, 
when we grow into being spiritually mature, you know, we are people who put away childish behavior, childish way of understanding, thinking and speaking. You know, uh, I'm sure if somebody hears you now, they will know that you are an adult. Uh, but if you're a kid, you know, you speak baby language, baby voice, uh, behave like a, uh, like a child, immature. But now as you grown up person, you know, uh, we do behave like adults most often, you know. Um, so uh, we cannot, uh, you know, uh, in the same way in the spiritual, in the spirit realm or in the, in the spiritual aspect, you know, we cannot continue to remain childish in our understanding of God, his ways, in the way we do things, you know, uh, we should not remain childish in our thoughts, understanding and our words. And if you are still childish in the way we behave, the way we understand God, the way we react, the way we live, uh, the way we understand things, uh, that means we are still carnal, you know, and to be carnal minded uh, is, uh, is uh, death. That's what Paul writes. You know, to be carnal minded is uh, death. The end result is death. But to be spiritually minded is life in Christ uh, Jesus. And he talks about this in um, Romans chapter uh, 8. Okay. So we need to put away childish uh, behavior and, you know, we need to uh, live in the spirit, walk in the spirit. Uh, and that is when we will be able to fulfill uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the lead. We will be able to do the, what the Holy Spirit is leading us and guiding us. And we will live according to the word of uh, God. Okay. So how do we know if we are carnal uh, and fleshly uh, minded, you know, if we are, you know, uh, the fruit of the uh, the flesh that is Paul lists out in uh, Romans chapter 5 envy division strife competition selfish ambition hatred fits of rage you know jealousy you know name it all of those are childish behavior and that is of a carnal nature and a carnal uh, nature a person uh, you know is not who's spiritually mature and he cannot understand um, uh, the things of God he cannot understand the ways of uh, God. The seventh one is that spiritual maturity is having your whole body and tongue in uh, control. Okay. Uh, so James writes in James chapter 3 verse 2 that we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is perfect. Telios, you know, uh, full of age and also uh, able to bridle the whole body. So a spiritually mature person has self-governing ability the ability to keep their body and tongue in uh, control. So um, self-control is a sign of spiritual uh, maturity, okay? And the book of Proverbs teaches us the importance of self-control. You know, uh, Proverbs 16 verse 32 says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city, okay? And uh, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28 from the Message Bible reads, a person without self-control is like a house with its doors and windows knocked off. Okay. So spiritual maturity is a process. It does not happen instantly. It takes time. And as we journey with God, as he works in, uh, in, in through our lives by his word, his spirit, and through uh, you know, godly people, the counsel of godly people, and through life experiences, we must constantly progress in spiritual maturity. Okay, it's time we'll uh, stop here. We look at kingdom stewardship in the next class. Uh, if you have any questions or doubts regarding uh, these two lectures, uh, please uh, feel free. Um, online students and in-person students to post your questions in the Google Classroom. I'll answer them. And our e-learning students, you can uh, do so in the discussion uh, tab. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, God bless.